Hey everybody, this is Tracy here for another edition of A View from Tracy's Point. And we are here to recap Queen Sugar Season 2, Episode 13, which was titled Heritage. So we finally get to meet Darla's parents and I must say they did a good job in casting um, Michael Michelle and Roger Gu Gu Don't get me lying. <laughs> Gubin Guinvar um, Smith, but he's an actor that we've seen around for quite some time. So I thought they were good uh, in the role of Darlene and Quentin. This episode right here, y'all, <laughs> I just had no words by the time the credits ended. And you already know I don't like Ralph and <laughs> Joe, but let's add Nova to the list. As a matter of fact, um, I just need somebody on this show to get to happy by the end of the season. I know that they've... Um, been signed for a third season but let's hope that um the next season we have some happiness that we don't have all of this just pain and anger and all this nonsense like lord jesus we got the we got the we got the week so anyway let's go ahead and get into this recap so the show opened with ralph angel outside washing up and darla was standing in the door and it was like one of the real country scenes where the guy you know he's out he's all dirty and musty and then the woman standing in the door with the little um thin cotton little slip dress on. <laughs> no. i don't know why whenever i see that scene it just always reminds me of the country but anyway darla was standing there with her little slip dress on and, you know she was encouraging her man and once again, I ain't understanding why Dollar ain't on her job over there at that sugar mill, but maybe it's the weekend. <laughs> so, anyway, you know, she's excited and nervous all at the same time about her parents coming to visit. And Ralph Angel, you know, reassures her that everything is going to be all right and that he's going to be there by her side, you know, to help her get through it. Then we move over to Aunt Violet, and she's at the doctor's office, and we find out that, um... Aunt Vi has been diagnosed with lupus. I was just like, well, I guess lupus is better than cancer or something because you can live with it. It's a chronic um, disease that causes a lot of pain, you know, because of different things that's like happening with the body. But it really takes Aunt Vi for a loop and, you know, it gets her really down. And so she goes home and she has all these books that she's gotten on the subject of lupus and how to live with lupus, how to have a diet you know, that helps with um, the disease and everything. And so she calls Darla on the phone and lets Darla know that she forgot that she had a big order that she had to do for the supermarket that she thought was the following week, but it was this week. But basically she was letting Darla know that she wasn't going to be able to host the dinner for her and her parents, you know, when the parents came and that she would do her best, you know, she would pay for the high yellow to cook the food and then she would bring some of her pies over. And so you, we can tell by that scene that Aunt Vi is going to be like the typical woman. <laughs> she's going to hold it all in. She doesn't want to tell anybody that she's ill because she probably sees it as a sign of weakness. And so she's going to try and fight through this thing all on her own. And I was trying to figure out, uh, Aunt Vi, why you ain't tell Hollywood? <laughs> but then we find out that Hollywood is in... um. He's out of town doing a deposition, I guess, for the accident that happened on the boat. So I guess she ain't told Hollywood either, you know, that they diagnosed her with lupus. So we'll see how Aunt Vi handled this. But Aunt Vi just know holding it all inside causes additional stress, which only serves to um, increase the symptoms of the disease that you have. So you need to get that out and let your family take care of you and love on you and finally treat you the way that you've always been there to protect them. Then we move over to Charlie. So Remy stops by Charlie. I think she was in her office. And so, you know, he wants to tell her all about the positive feedback that the community gave about the um, Brown Sugar Festival. 
and that you know the community wants it to be an annual event once again and that they support her and they're behind her and, you know so then Remy says that he wants to take Charlie out to dinner and celebrate and then maybe they can do some something, something afterwards <laughs> and I was just like Ooh, okay, really now? So, you know, them two, I said it before, they ain't got no chemistry. I don't want them together. I want Charlie and Davis to figure their situation out and go and be back together and be a force to reckon with. To reckon with. And hopefully Davis has learned his lesson. And so, you know, they were getting all romantic on the couch and everything. And then I think uh, Remy brought up his deceased wife. <laughs> so it's just like, Charlie was looking at like... Can we not talk about her anymore? Like, if we're going to have a future together, can we leave her in the past? So, Charlie was just looking like, mm -mm, we ain't about to do this. So, then later on that night, uh, Remy showed up at Charlie's place, you know, because they going to have this little secret rendezvous. Now, I don't know what happened to the dinner that they were supposed to have to celebrate. But he was at her place, and Charlie all dressed in her little... Um, they she had like a panty and bra set and then she had like a little uh, wrap over it and everything. So, bring me come on in. They trying to get all romantic, but it was looking all awkward and everything. Charlie pulled the robe off and, you know, I was like, child, what is y'all getting ready to do right now? <laughs> well, before I could get the question out, um, they weren't about to do anything because then Remy says that uh, he wants forever with Charlie. <laughs> Charlie was like, uh oh, pump your brakes. So then she was like, um, you know, maybe we should have talk, talked about some things before we got to this moment. I'm like, yeah, maybe y'all should have uh, talked about some things before y'all all have naked in the bed and rolling around like y'all about to get busy. But Remy said he wants to have some kids and Charlie said she ain't having no more damn kids. <laughs> so then they was talking and I'm like, okay. And then I'm like, okay, so this mood is totally killed. So I'm glad Charlie didn't um, have sex with Remy because that just would have complicated the breakup. So then they were talking and Remy asked Charlie, uh, could she at least just think about it? And Charlie said, no, I ain't even trying to think about it. Charlie had... I don't know, Charlie, he was wrong. You kind of did Remy wrong. But y'all know that's how the good guys get treated, like... We want them bad boys and we just do the little nice guys in the Callaway. Because Charlie wouldn't have had that same conversation with Davis. She would be like, yeah, we can have some more babies and we can work things out. And then I got to thinking, what was Micah? We didn't see Micah this entire episode. So did he go to Los Angeles with Davis? Like, he wasn't at the dinner with um, Dollar's parents when they came or anything. So, maybe he went Maybe went on to California with his daddy. Or maybe he went with, um, now the grandmama had already left before they had the festival. So, I don't know where Michael was on this episode. Then we go on over here to Nova. <laughs> so, Nova is so typical. <laughs> Because we all got a friend that we can talk to. Like, we got a friend that we talk about, you know, serious things. A friend that we talk about when we know, we talk to when we know we're totally out of order. Then we got our religious friends. So, we always have a friend for every situation. So, Nova um, goes to lunch with, uh, what's the girl named Sierra? So, she up there, you know, talking all that trash with um, Sierra about Dr. Dubois and how he was controlling and he was trying to tell her how to talk and how to walk and how to dress and all this other stuff. And Sierra said that to me, girl, good thing you got out that mess before it got too far. I was sitting there like, girl, when you checking all uh, Dr. Dubois out when they was out there cleaning up their field so nobody could have their rally? So, why the two of them sitting there talking um, in walks Calvin into the restaurant? So, him and Nova lock eyes and she just lose her train of thought and what she was talking about and they staring at each other, lusting and carrying on. So then Calvin comes over and uh, Sierra was sitting up like, well, who is this? Like, I ain't never met this man before. So she shakes off Calvin's hand and introduce herself. And so then uh, she said she'll go ahead and leave, get him some privacy. But Nova said, no, nah, we're here having lunch. And um, it was good to see you, Calvin. So then Calvin look at her and say, okay, well, I'll call you later. And we all know that that's cold word for uh, be ready because I'm going to show up later on at night. So Nova's like, yeah, you do that. So then when Calvin walk off, Calvin walks off. See, Era had no idea who Calvin was, had never met him, and Nova had never talked about. Him. So I guess that was like a little guilty pleasure, a little secret that she wasn't gonna tell nobody about. So like clockwork, 
Nova at the house lounging around her t-shirt and her pants on. <laughs> then we are knock knock at the door. So it's Calvin and he came and you know he wants to pour his heart out to her and you know let her know that seeing her in the um little restaurant and little cafe reminded him or let him know that he really wasn't over her and it just brought up all these memories and then Nova admits that you know she hadn't moved on either and she realizes that uh she was at war with herself <laughs> and y'all know I'm gonna start calling her noble Nova because when Nova get to going into them little speeches she be giving she just had this air about her like she is just a noble woman and she way up here and the rest of us way down here so noble nova is what we gonna call her so the man pouring out his heart to nova and telling her that every decision he's made in life it was because somebody else wanted him to do that his dad wanted him to play football his dad wanted him to go to college his dad wanted him to be a police officer his, you know his family told him he needed to get married and then he got married and then they was like okay well y'all need to have some kids so they had some kids so he lets Nova know that she was the only choice that he had made for himself in his life. And that he was just tired of doing what everybody else wanted him to do. And he was ready to love her and give her everything that she wanted. And the two of them, you know, confessed that they love each other. And, you know, they can't live without each other. But then Nova Nova showed up. <laughs> so she gives the opposite speech to Calvin that she had given to Dr. Dubois. So Dr. Dubois was trying to control her and he wanted her to step outside her comfort zone and he wanted her, you know, to be this woman that she wasn't ready to be and she happy living in the Ninth Ward doing her speeches and fighting for the people. So with Calvin, <laughs> she said that um, she can't be that person and that, you know, she may be freedom to him, but um, for her, it's living in a prison, that she would be in a prison and she can't be herself. And she said she can't fight for the people and then come home to a white man. That she can't um, cry over a black man getting killed in the street by the police and then come home to a police. <laughs> so I guess they screwed one last time, y'all. Because I could have sworn when Calvin showed up, it was nighttime. <laughs> it, was, it was dusk. The sun was going down, but when Calvin uh, walked out that door and they kissed goodbye, the sun was coming out. <laughs> so, I don't know how we went to the speech about why they couldn't be together and how he couldn't be a part of her life and how he couldn't understand that she is in the fight for the people and that's all she won't do in life. <laughs> but um, anyway, I guess Calvin is out of the picture now. So we didn't get rid of Dr. Why we didn't get rid of Calvin. I don't know what Nova going to do about her love life at this point. Now we go over to Raph's Angel and Darla. <laughs> so Darla, Charlie, and Nova, you know, they're getting things ready at the house uh, for the dinner with um with Darla's parents and Ralph Angel comes in, you know, from working out in the fields. I guess he had done harvest his soybeans. And so he lets them know that Prosper was wrong with the estimate he gave him about him. He was going to break even. And so they looking like, oh my God, and then lost money on the crop. But he lets them know that he made 20% more than Prosper told him that he was going to make. So then Charlie asks Ralph Angel, so you going to quit the job at the seafood plant? <laughs> So I'm like, okay, that when Hollywood told Ralph Angel about the job at the seafood plant, uh, Ralph Angel turned his nose up at the job and didn't want nothing to do with that. So now how he done got the job, working on the job and considering uh, quitting the job. So it's just like, how much time done passed since last episode and this episode? Because y'all just be doing too much on Queen Sugar. So I don't know if they just threw that in for good measure or what. So we stopped talking about Ralph Angel because, you know, everybody was like, Negro, you are in no position to be talking about um, you too good for a job. But uh, Ralph Angel said he's going to keep the job at the um, seafood plant because he wants to be able to give Darla a wedding. And so we was like, OK, well, good for you, Ralph Angel. Then all of a sudden, um, Luther Vandross' um, All My Love came on. I didn't even know the radio was on. <laughs> The song came on. Ralph Angel and Blue started dancing around. Then Nova and Charlie and Darla, you know, they got into it. Then 
Rat, um, Aunt Vi showed up with the pies, and so they was telling her, Aunt Vi, come on, come on, you know, join in. So they had, that was about the happiest moment that there was on the entire show. That probably was the happiest moment there's been on the entire season. <laughs> so I guess we'll take the moments as they come. So that was cute little camaraderie with the family uh, getting along at that moment. So Dollar's parents arrived. And seemed genuinely happy to see Dala. They didn't seem like they were snobs, angry, you know. That, I don't know what Dala was expecting, but they seemed like good people to me. So Dala introduces them to Ralph Angel and Blue, and I'm sitting there like, Ralph Angel ain't never met a mom before, mom and daddy before. <laughs> I was so confused and they ain't never met Blue. The daughter that had a baby and this first time y'all done met Blue. So Blue being Blue, you know, he runs over and hugs uh, Darla's dad. And he was like holding on to him, you know, wrapped, had his little arms wrapped around the man's leg. The man didn't know what to do. So I was like, Blue is so cute and you could always count on him to lighten the mood. Oh, and before Darla's parents arrived, um, there was a scene with Ralph Angel and Blue where Blue was asking Ralph Angel, you know, what should he call Darla's parents? Because he's like, you know, I never had a grandma before. And then Papa, you know, uh, Ralph Angel's dad, you know, that was Papa. So they decided, you know, it's going to be grandma and grandpa, I think is what they decided on. So get on the dinner. So at dinner, Ralph Angel says to Grace, you know, he's sitting at the head of the table. He's the man of the house. So then Darlene, Darla's mom, you know, she tries to break the ice and be friendly, you know, so she's talking about how much she likes New Orleans, but how she's never really been able to see the whole city because, you know, the only time she had been there was when she was dropping Darla off at the university. So Darla, like, gave her a look, like, why you got to bring that back up? It reminded me that I'm a failure. So, you know, it was kind of tense. But then um, Quincy, what was the man's name? Quincy or Quincy? I think his name was Quincy. <laughs> so Quincy chimes in and, you know, he starts telling um, Nova that he saw her when she was on television and that, you know, she was a natural and she's really good and he believes that, you know, that could lead to her having her own TV show but then Nova Nova shows up and says that uh, she doesn't see that in her path. You know, she's happy doing just what she's doing in that ninth ward preaching to the people over there in her neighborhood. So then he tells her, you know, that it's a shame and then he moves on to Charlie and, you know, he gives her her kudos, you know, for being a sports manager and leading Davis's career. And then when that fell apart, you know, she came on home and became the first, I can't remember if he said the first woman or the first black woman owner of a sugar mill and how she should be so proud of herself. So he ain't had nothing good to say to Ralph Angel did. It was kind of a little quiet there. So Charlie chimed in and she said, oh, you know, I couldn't do it without Dollar. You know, she is so good. She's such a help to me. And so he said, yeah, I'm sure both of you ladies could uh, teach Dollar a few things. And then Ralph Angel, you know, his pride for self. Well, Dollar could teach them some things too because, you know, she's worked hard and did such a good job, you know, to get her life back on path and on track and I was like, Lord, have mercy. But the man was kind of rude to Ralph Angel because I guess he was like, well, what do you do? You know, you done been to jail and have a daughter out there struggling, struggling and strung out on drugs. Like, what's your claim to fame? And I guess he don't know that Ralph Angel owned the farm. <laughs> so hopefully um, they won't, you know, hopefully they'll be back a couple of more episodes and they'll get to learn a little bit more about Ralph Angel. So then I invite offers to take Blue for the night, you know, so they could have some quality time together. And so her and Darlene go into uh, Blue's bedroom and they're packing his overnight bag. And so two ladies, you know, they have a moment to talk. So then Darlene asked on Vi if she thought Blue had been impacted by, you know, what all Darla had been through and not having them around and just all the craziness that had gone on. And so we learned that Darlene used to send Aunt Vi money every month to take care of Blue. <laughs> so that sparked a few questions in my mind. You know, we already had this suspect handoff of custody between Aunt Vi and Ralph Angel where all she had to do was sign a piece of paper. They didn't have to go to court. They didn't need no social workers to make sure that Ralph Angel was capable of taking care of Blue or any of that. 
any of that. So then I got to wondering, um, the other guy passed that money on to Ralph Angel after she signed them custody papers and she's still getting the money or did the money stop coming at some point? And then why wasn't Darlene surprised to know that Blue no longer lived with Aunt Vi, that Blue lives with Darla and Ralph Angel? And then Aunt Vi and Darlene been talking all these years. <laughs> you know, if, if Darlene been giving her money, Seemed like there's been some talking going on. And it got me to wondering, so was Darlene just sending money in the mail or was her and Aunt Vi in touch with each other? Because how Darla haven't talked to her parents in all these years, but Aunt Vi been getting this money coming in every month. I'm gonna need y'all to do a little better with some of these um, writing and these storylines that y'all got going on. So Darlene says that, you know, she's sorry for all the time that she missed with Blue and with Darla. And then Aunt Vi lets her know that she's there now. You know, and that's all that's matter. Let's just start scratch from where we are right now. So then we have a scene the following day where Darla and her mom, you know, they're having a heart-to-heart -heart talk. And, you know, and Darla got the nerve to be in her feelings talking about how, you know, she done called and they wouldn't answer her calls and she done wrote them letters and they never responded. And uh, Dolly was like, girl, let me get something clear with you. You were a drug addict. You were a lying drug addict. You were a lying manipulative drug addict. And we had to make a decision. Either we was going to do this time with you, be addicted with you, or we were going to regain our sanity and our peace of mind and put you off to the side, give you some tough love and let you decide whether you want to continue to be a junkie or get your life together. So she wasn't holding back on Darla. Like, girl, I hope you ain't right here got these people thinking that we done abandoned you and didn't want to have anything to do with you when you were the one that caused this situation. I was like, that's right, mama. Let her know. Ain't nobody joining her pity party right now. So then Darla, you know, she had to sit back and recognize <laughs> that, you know, she was the result she calls all of what had happened in her life. And so Darla apologizes, you know, which seriously was all she could do. And she tells her mother, you know, yes, I'm clear that I understand that I was wrong. I caused this situation. So the two of them hug and they were crying. And, you know, Darla lets her know that she really loves her and that she's happy that her and her dad are there. So then Darla goes, oh, and then um, Darlene let Darla know that, you know, she was hurt by everything that happened, but the dad really took it hard, and it was harder for him, you know, to kind of, like, shut Darla out and force Darla to get our act together. And so then Darla goes out and finds the dad, so the two of them get to talking, and Darla apologizes, you know, for everything that she put him through. So she's telling him, you know, how she's changed, and she's a good mother, and she's a good person, and she's going to be a good wife. But Quincy said, pump your brakes right there, because you can't be sitting there talking about you're going to be a good wife when you holding on to secrets. And what you need to do is go find Ralph Angel and tell him your secret and then let him make a choice or rather not he gonna be your husband. <laughs> so I was like, well, damn, what Dollar did did? Like, what's going on? So then Dollar goes and she finds on Ralph Angel. And he was out there working in the back of the house. And I'm just like, what Dollar about to tell Ralph Angel? Lord, she told Ralph Angel she loved him. She was sorry, but she had to tell him the truth. <laughs> and I'm just sitting there like, what y'all about to say? Uh, Darla said she snuck home back to D.C. <laughs> One night. I don't know where Ralph Angel was. But she done went home for the weekend and then went to a party and then got high and drunk and then hooked up with some man that might be Blue Daddy. <laughs> well, damn, Darla. Now, I'm not surprised that Blue might not be Ralph Angel's uh, child because I think before we met Darla, I had been trying to figure out how Ralph Angel got this little mixed looking child. Like, who is the mama of this child? <laughs> so, I wasn't surprised to hear that Darla had cheated on Ralph Angel. But I still was caught off guard and was not ready to hear her say to this man that Blue might not be his child. That was the last thing. And then actually I was like, is Dolly about to tell him she HIV positive or something? I don't know that she she wasn't going to marry him, that she had gone back to D.C. to take care of some things. I don't know what I thought Dolly was going to say. But it was not that she... Um, the screw somebody else and that Blue might not be his child. And Lord knows as much as I can't stand Ralph Angel, that look on his face 
<laughs> when Darla said that, and then when he walked off and went and squatted down, and you know he was probably, he was so heartbroken. I was like, oh my God. So yeah, guys, um, I don't know. <laughs> and then um, Ava had the nerve to make a post on Twitter talking about um, something about all the love on the, on the show. And she was so excited and couldn't wait for this episode so we could explore the love. And I'm like, what love? I mean, we got Charlie don't want Remy. <laughs> she just playing with the man because she's still in love with Davis. I don't know yet that she's still in love with Davis. Then we got Aunt Vi, you know, she all alone, Hollywood done left town, and she done found out she got lupus. And then we got Nova, who don't know what she wants. She just lost days and doggone confused. And then now we got Ralph Angel and Dollar and find out that their whole relationship was a lot. So I don't know what Ava was looking forward to on this episode, but um, I know they're getting on my nerves, and I just need somebody to be happy, even for five minutes on the next episode. So that's it for guys. That's it for me, guys. Let me know what you thought about this episode. Leave your comments below. Rate the video. Share the video on your social media platforms. And until the next time, I shall talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.